Hi biology class, this is Mr. Yago and today we're going through section 13.6 and 13.7 out of your Patterns of Inheritance section, um, or excuse me, chapter. This one's going to be on sex determination. So essentially what we're looking at uh, is a little review from meiosis, also looking at how we generate uh, males versus females and also looking at the chromosomes involved in that. So we're going to look at determining the sex of individuals and the difference between the X and the Y chromosome, which will give us either a guy or this lady right here. So to start this section out, on the right side of your screen, we have a karyotype. And we have that chart which looks at all of the various sets of 23 chromosomes. And you'll notice that the 23rd chromosome um, is considered the sex chromosome. And chromosomes come in matching pairs, as we talked about, except for these sex chromosomes, which may be different. And as you notice here, we have an X and a Y, which we'll know that that means a male. And we have an XX, which represents a female. So, all eggs produced in females during meiosis have an X chromosome. As you can see up here, we have an egg that has an X chromosome, and we have an egg here that has an X chromosome. Now, remember when we discussed the difference in the sex cells, we said that they are both haploid. So, this egg has 23 chromosomes, this egg has 23, this sperm has 23, and this sperm has 23. So, the goal of fertilization is going to be establishing that dual chromosome set of 46 total chromosomes, or the diploid 23 pairs. Now, as I mentioned before, all eggs are going to be X chromosomes, but notice that the guys will actually determine the sex of the child. All right. So the sperm that has an X chromosome here, if it fertilizes this egg, that will make a girl. If uh, we have this Y chromosome sperm and it fertilizes the X, we'll have an XY or a male. So half of the sperm produced during meiosis have an X chromosome and the other half have a Y. It's kind of a 50-50 shot. Now, that doesn't necessarily determine the gender of the child. What will happen is whether that X or that Y makes it and fertilizes the egg. So it's a 50-50 shot in terms of getting the X or the Y and 50% of the sperm that a male produces will be X and roughly 50% will be Y. So if you look at this chart here, sex determination is determined at the moment the egg is fertilized. So you see we have a female parent and a male parent. The female only can make X chromosomes and the eggs, and then the male can either make an X or a Y. So if the X chromosome for the sperm links up with the X egg, we make a female, and the opposite would be if the Y chromosome met up with the X egg, we would have a male. So there you can get kind of the idea of how this works on a very simple basis. So this next section is going to be 13.7, and we're going to be looking at multiple alleles and alleles without dominance. Uh, things that we will learn is we're going to define and understand incomplete dominance, and we're going to define and understand codominance, define and understand multiple alleles, and understand how blood types are involved in genetics. It's one of the simplest ways to understand genetics in terms of how alleles and traits uh, get passed on hereditarily. So if you take a look at this chart, we're going to go into great detail, and it's something that I teach in human phys where we look at the blood groups. Everyone has a blood type, and we can determine blood type based off of your parents parents blood type. So if you didn't know what your blood type is, we could at least predict the percentages of what it could be based off of if we knew your parents blood type. So we're going to look at that in much greater detail. All right, so in Mendelian genetics, as you can see, this is Gregor Mendel right here, most notable for looking at pea plants and showing how a phenotypical trait, which is a physical trait, like flower color uh, is passed on and how we can breed different colors and gain different colors. So in Medellin genetics, traits were either dominant or recessive. And dominance is essentially showing that it is, is the one that's going to be in control, the most likely. And a recessive is something that doesn't always get expressed unless it is met up with another recessive allele. So this section will look at genes that do not follow that pattern. And we call those non medallion genetics. All right, so in this slide, we're going to look at and define incomplete dominance, and that results in a blending of the phenotype or physical features of the organism. So I want you to take a second, put your pencils down, and look at this image right here. 
Okay. In this image, we have a red flower and a white flower. And to show the genetics, we have a capital R and a capital R to show that this is red, and a capital W and a capital W to show that this is white. Now, we would consider these both being dominant, okay? When they are capital letters, they are to be shown as dominant. So what would happen if we took these two traits and we blended them together? Well, notice that we get a pink flower. Because the red was dominant and the white was dominant, they both showed up and actually blended into a pink flower. And notice that if you took a, a dominant white flower and a dominant red flower and blended together, you would get a 100% ratio of a pink flower. That is what we define as incomplete dominance. Now, this is just essentially jotting that down for you. So red flowers cross with a white flower, you get a pink flower. In this case, both red and white were dominant, but the traits were shared. So incomplete dominance is a blending or sharing, as you can see down here, of those traits. So I would say it's probably a pretty good idea to maybe jot a quick little explanation or visual in your notes that helps you understand what incomplete dominance is. All right, so if both phenotypes appear in heterozygous individuals, the alleles are said to be codominant. So now we're going to look at codominance, and this is, this is definitely found in human blood types. And what I want to do quick is just explain what's going on in this chart. We can have either A blood, B blood, AB blood, or O blood, okay? And what, one thing that we're going to look at in this is we're going to look at what signifies A blood, what signifies B blood, AB blood, and O blood. And we're going to explain how that essentially divulges into codominance. So blood type is dependent upon the presence of or absence of type A or type B antigens on the surface of blood cells. So an antigen can be kind of difficult to understand, but essentially think of it as if, let's say, you were on the basketball team and you have a Falcons jersey on. That Falcon signifies, it's a symbol that signifies what team you're on. Type A blood has a logo on it, essentially, like a Falcon logo, that says that, hey, I am in type A blood cell. And people who have type A blood cells are going to have all of these little antigens or flags on it, letting the body know it is type A. Now, it also has antibodies in it, which are type B. So think of an antibody. Anti means against or not. So if you were to give someone who has type A blood a transfusion of type A, B blood, you will see that the body will actually fight it off and attack it because it is not type A blood. So that's why you have anti-B antibodies. And we'll go into that in a little more detail greater, but it's going to help us understand this codominance. So notice that on this chart that type AB blood has both A and B antigens. And this is the type of blood that I have. So I actually could take blood from anyone who is A or B or O, which we'll talk about in a second. But notice that they have both. This means that two dominant alleles are shared, aka they are codominant. So I actually have codominant blood running through my arteries and veins, which is pretty cool. So essentially what we're looking at is the fact that although A is dominant and B is dominant, none of those are recessive, that the body can actually have both on its blood cells. So Blood types are involved in multiple alleles. We also have type O blood, which contains neither type A or type B antigens. However, it does contain both A and B antibodies. Now, what's unique about that is that if you look here, type O blood has nothing on its surface to say that it is either type A or type B. That's why we call it type O. So it essentially has no antigens, but notice it has both A and B. So take a second and think, if I ask this question, what would happen if you had type O blood and I put type A blood into your body? Hopefully you thought in your head that the body would fight it off. Same thing with type B. So type O blood, in this case, is going to be considered recessive. It is not dominant, whereas type A and B are considered dominant, and therefore someone like me who has AB blood would be codominant. So here's what's unique about transfusion. So uh, folks, a transfusion is when you need blood and we would have to basically set up an IV to pump that blood back into you. 
So the nice thing about blood groups is that if you, let's say you are type A blood, notice down in this chart that you can either be type AA, which is dominant, homozygous, remember homo means the same, and you have two A's, so that's homozygous, or you could be type AO. Now that is heterozygous, meaning that if you are a parent, you could have you could have one allele that is A and one allele that is O, which means that you got an A group from a mom or a dad, and you got an O group from your mom or your dad. Same thing with type B. You could have BB, which is homozygous, or BO, which is heterozygous. And for me, with type A, AB blood, I have an A and a B. I'm codominant. And type O blood, there can only be one type of O blood, and that's OO. Because if you were OA, then you'd be type A, because A is dominant. If you were OB, as you can see here, you would be type B because B is dominant. O is always recessive. Now here's how the transfusion works. If you have type A blood, you can receive A or O. So we like to call O the universal donor. Anybody can get type O blood. So you can imagine if you were a blood bank, what type of blood would you want to have on hand? I would say O would be the best because that means that you could give that to anybody. Okay. So, type AB blood, however, can receive A, B, and O, which is kind of nice for me. Type AB blood is the universal receiver. So let's talk a little more, bit more about these antibodies. Now, an antibody is something that would be classified under our body's immune system. Okay, and that's going to help signal that something doesn't belong in the body. A lot of times antibodies will attach themselves to bacteria, viruses, anything that would maybe cause a common cold and basically tell the body, hey, this, this certain cell, bacteria, virus, whatever, is not supposed to be here. And then other cells inside the body, uh, most notably white blood cells, will attack that and kill it. So how does that work in the blood? Well, as I mentioned before, type A blood, as you can see down here, is going to have anti-B antibodies, which essentially mean if you put anything of the B variety right here into someone with A blood, it's going to attack it and kill it, and vice versa. So type B blood has type A antibodies. I, with type AB blood, have none, which is kind of nice. So essentially, any blood, A, B, A, B, or O, that goes into my system will not be attacked by it. So, if you haven't already, I would definitely try your best to put this chart into your notes. And essentially what you could do, you don't necessarily have to draw this, this blood cell with the A on it, but I would definitely write A antigen for A. Type B blood, I would put B antigens. And type A, B, A and B. Type O, no antigens. And then as you can see, the same thing down here with the antibodies. B antibodies for A, A antibodies for B, none for type AB in both A and B for type O blood. This will just kind of help you give a better understanding of the genetics and we can set these up into Punnett squares. You know, for instance, we could say we have a parent who is double O blood and another parent who is AB blood. We can predict the outcomes of a child's blood type. So again, these are outcomes. They're not 100% because there's probability. As we know, as we talked about through the process of mitosis and meiosis, most notably meiosis, we talked about things called independent assortment and, um, oh, I can't think of it off the top of my head, uh, rearrangement. So th those two will essentially give us change, all right, so that we can only predict probability. So here's a little test. If a person who has type A blood received a transfusion of type B blood, what would happen? So if you take a look at your chart here, type A blood has an A antigen and anti-B antibodies. That would mean that if you put type B blood into someone with type A blood, these antibodies would attach to those red blood cells and basically kill it. So this concludes everything for this unit. Uh, what you will be looking at next is definitely going through Punnett square practice, and we'll kind of predict some blood types in the human body. But hopefully this gives you a better understanding of what codominance means, incomplete dominance, and the fact that blood groups can have multiple alleles. Also, don't forget to remember the first part of the section where we talked about sex determination and the sex chromosomes. I know it was a very short section, but that's going to help us predict whether or not we're going to have a male or a female. So, that's all I have for this section. Good luck to you. Study hard on this test. Yago, out.